This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, former Senate Republican leader Bill Frist talks with Andy Slavitt, a former advisor on the response to COVID-19 in the Biden administration, about his book, Preventable, the inside story of how leadership failures, politics, and selfishness doomed the U.S. coronavirus response. Andy, it's uh, great to be with you today uh, in so, so many ways. Uh, again, interacting in the past and so many times, but to talk about your great book. Well, great to be with you again, Senator. Listen, I, I am excited to talk about your, your uh, book that just out, Preventable, the inside story of how leadership, failures, politics, and selfishness doomed the U.S. coronavirus uh, response. A, a, a great book. It's an insider's account, a behind the scenes look. I'll have to say painful at times, but a real eye opener. And there's so much we can talk about, but let's jump right in and start with the big picture. What is the, the top line um, overview, 30,000 foot look? And why did you write this book? Okay. Well, look, managing a pandemic is hard and, and we all ought to be forgiving of you know, uh, kind of honest mistakes and, and people with good intentions who just don't know um, what the facts are until they until they come out. So this isn't a book about finding, you know, flaws. In fact, um, you know, I posit in the book that while getting an A in prevention in, 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 in fighting a, a uh, pandemic is hard, getting a B is relatively easy because if you show if you show empathy and if you work hard and if you and if you mean well and try to save people's lives, and, and and keep things balanced with businesses and so forth, you know, uh, you deserve a B. But there, there were a few things that happened in this pandemic, at least in the U.S., that I think were extraordinary and above and beyond just simple um, mis- miscalculations. Um, you know, one, 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 and, you know, some of them related to the president, and but not all of them. Um, I would sit here and tell you today that um, if we had a different uh, president, uh, we still would have had a lot of challenges with this pandemic, you know, but, but there were some characteristics of the president which I think are worth visiting. Um, one, uh, just simply um, his ability and willingness to deny the problem that we had for for too long, and then and then when once he uh, had to confess it because, in large part, because the NBA went down and uh, the stock market then followed. Uh, even then, he minimized it. I think if the president would have just simply said, "Hey, we have a problem." Uh, early, as soon as he knew it, per uh, uh, we would have been in we would have been in better shape. And you know, he he insisted that narrative push through his team as well. And I think you know the dangerous thing that I think we observed is just quashing of any dissent. Uh, someone you and I both know, Alex Azar, who was the the health secretary, um, was actually pulled off of Fox and Friends. This is related in my book. Um, because he simply wanted to use the phrase, things could change rapidly. So he wanted to say things are okay, but they could change rapidly. And Katie Miller, White House Communications, pulled him off Fox and Friends and said he couldn't speak to the media for 45 days. So imagine that this, uh, Senator, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, it's just starting, and our own Department of Health and Human Services isn't permitted to even communicate with the public. So, I, you know, I... It wasn't all uh, um, a horror show, and there were good people in there who you and I were probably both working with who were trying to do the right things, but they were hobbled, um, a large part by the person they worked for. Uh, and so, you know, in there, the book contains, you know, the reason I wrote it is I spent a fair amount of time with Jared Kushner and Debbie Burks and Tony Fauci and others. Uh, and there's an inside account of things that I felt needed to be told. But I would also tell you that there are things we learned about our country above and beyond who's in the, in the Oval Office that I think were also important to tell because they're things we need to look at. Andy, when people work for the president, you've worked for, for uh, been in and out of, of, of government and familiar uh, really with both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, you've worked with, with both. Uh, take, take us a, a bit into when you're working for the president uh, of the United States, who is uh, the elected commander in chief, commander in chief implies uh, just what it is. And that is you're in charge. You do dictate. Um, how hard is it? You mentioned in, in the book, you go into a whole, a whole slew of, of examples, but 
How hard is it for the, whether it's the Azars or Deborah Burks, in which you go into, into a, a great detail about, you know, even at the end and traveling with her, but how hard is it? And what is your responsibility in working for the commander in chief to take those orders, even though those orders may be different than, than what you feel? Take us a little bit into that world because I know well, it's going to be challenging. The president sets the tone. And, you know, I imagine some presidents are more sticklers than others about that tone. Um, so, you know, if you're going to work for the president, you better well reflect what he or she wants, or you're going to be, um, find yourself out. And that's, I think, one of the things we learned with many of the scientists that eventually started to question Trump's strategy, um, whether it's an FDA or CDC or Tony Fauci or Deborah Burks, is if you didn't um, comply with that storyline. I want, I want to make one comment first, which is that this is not, in, in my view, and in fact, in most people's view, a partisan um, issue in terms of how this was managed. In other words, a Mitt Romney presidency, a George W. Bush presidency, uh, a Bill Frist presidency um, would have been, um, I think, much closer to a Joe Biden response to the pandemic, as many Republican governors around the country showed. I think this is more specific, actually, to a populist president, to a president who wanted to play to, to the crowd, not make tough decisions. So I just want to be clear that this isn't in, in, in any way a Democrat versus Republican um, issue uh, in my mind. Uh, and, you know, I think you, there are so many perfectly competent Democrats and Republicans, Scott Gottlieb, Martin McClellan, and others, who could have been running this pandemic for, uh, for, uh, for Mitt Romney or that, that I think we would, have, we would have seen that. But, you know, I'll tell, I'll, I'll tell you the answer to the question by way of a, a relating something that happened to me when I went to work for Joe Biden is I was and this, I relate this in the book. He called me into the Oval Office um, and he was talking about how, because I was, I was really in charge of public communication for the pandemic and he wanted to uh, make sure I understood something, which was that we need to explain things simply to the public. And he, and he said, uh, and as I've quoted him in the book, is saying, don't worry about making me look good. Give the public the information they need. Now, remember, this is, this is late January. Thousands of people are dying. People aren't able to get their vaccine. They don't know when they're going to be able to get it. They're scared. We don't know when this is coming to an end. And I'll just tell you, that made my job so much easier. So, you know, if, if you have to go out and perform for the president and make sure the president sees you casting him in a favorable light, it, it, it sometimes gets in the way of what you're trying to communicate. And I didn't have that problem. Um, I had a much easier task because the president essentially said, we need to fix this. And, and the implication is we're going to get judged by whether we fix it or not, not by whether or not, you know, you, you say anything that makes me, me look good. And, and uh, indeed, um, I think, as we know, President Trump um, was very uh, careful about what people said about him in public. And um, Deborah Burks faced that and so did others. In, in, in the book, and, and I'll read, it says, um, in, in the book, Preventable, again, just, just out, fantastic read. Uh, it says, a uh, book chronicles what you saw and what could have been prevented, an unflinching in investigation of the cultural, of the political and economic drivers that led to unnecessary loss of, of life. That's a, that's a pretty powerful description. And I, my question is, was there a moment for you in the midst of, of this uh, overwhelming pandemic for all of us that really crystallized the need uh, for you to, to tell the story? Was there a, a, a moment that it said, okay, I've got to share this with the American people? Yeah, I, I think the thing that um, was so concerning. Again, you're going to have a pandemic. You're going to lose a lot of lives. It's going to be, it's going to be a horrible situation. But oftentimes, those are, those are occasions when the country can pull together and, and do good things. But for that to happen, you know, it, it does take extraordinary acts of leadership. And in my conversations and in my interactions at the White House, there was a point in time when I think the people in the White House were quite optimistic that the president was going to start to take this seriously. This was in the second half of March. And they started putting together plans that would help the country balance its reopening, save lives, still focus on 
people's economic needs. Um, and I think everybody from Deborah Birx to Jared to others felt like uh, that, that may be the direction the president goes. Um, but that, that ended in a series of events where um, the president saw protests in Michigan and Minnesota and saw that there was this, I think, populist sentiment. Um, and from that moment on, I think he really, um, in many respects, uh, decided to abdicate leadership to the, and he did this in a couple of ways. One was something he called the, the, um, the that, that where they basically decided they put together a plan to, to put, to try to get claim success for opening the country, but put any blame for anything that went wrong on the state governors. Um, and he did that by not, by not acquiring testing, allowing the states to just bid against one another uh, for, for testing. Um, and from, from that moment on, um, the staff, um, Burks, others who had been working quite hard, were very disheartened because I think they believed that they could gain on it. But the president wanted no part of that. And so when he was presented with options, and I spent a lot of time with the person in the book who does all of the analysis for the president, uh, Blythe Adamson, who's a fascinating woman. Um, when she was putting together options for the president, she wasn't even in the options she was asked to put together. She didn't even put together a single option that had the federal government um, uh, show with accountable for um, running this pandemic. She was not asked to put together an analysis showing what's the way we can um, do what most of the countries in the world did, which is figure out how to save the most lives and create the most balance. It wasn't even an option on the table, whether or not the president selected it. So it was clear to me in the spring that he believed he could get reelected if he kept the stock market up, um, uh, or at least that seemed to be the path he was going on, and that he would that the pandemic he'd be able to allow to be able to push blame on to, to others. And, and at that point, I felt like that's a story that probably should be told. I'll tell you, while, while I started telling that story, um, in the end, I would say the book is not about President Trump. The book is not about politics. Um, the book actually ends up diving into, as you said, some of the cultural and economic and other issues that, that, have, that about who we've become that are, in some respects, even more interesting. Yeah, and then I do want to come back to those because throughout the book, uh, although right now we're spending a lot of time, and it's interesting because that inside story is 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 painted throughout the the book. But the book really does put it in the perspective that it's not just a, the president of the United States um, that that caused so many of the challenges that we've seen. That it is this larger ecosystem. So let's come back to that. But but in in the book, and and just for our listeners. Um, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with you in so many ways on so many issues in, in the past, but you work with, with uh, Democrats and you work with the Republicans. Uh, people know who Andy Slavitt is. Um, you're very forthcoming. And it's again the book. It's painted that way. It's in your tweets. It's in social media. But uh, continually, you work closely with Republicans. They, they trust you. They know who you are and with Democrats. You work on both sides of the aisle. It's important for our listeners and people who are reading your book to, to know that. You've informally advised uh, members of the Trump administration, and you would describe much of that in your book. In, in, in the book, it says, and I'll, I'll read this, I, I was one of the few people and certainly one of the only Democrats, you say in, in the book, who was talking to the Trump White House on a regular basis during the first year of the pandemic. And I had developed a clear understanding of what was wrong with their response. Anything else uh, to, to elaborate just a little bit more? And we already introduced, uh, but where, where was the central failure? You mentioned that things were turned over to the states and the fact that the, 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 some, the much of the science was squelched to the side. Was there any one central failing that, that would encompass everything else that we talked about? Well, maybe, maybe I'll answer it this way. Um, and I appreciate your comments. When I went in on January 20th to work in the Biden administration for the last 130 days to turn things around, the one decision that the president made that I think um, was responsible largely for any success we've had in the vaccination program was his decision to be 100% fully accountable. No fights with governors, no distractions, no excuses. 
when we had a bad weather event, as you recall, uh, Bill, because it struck Tennessee quite hard, um, it struck uh, down our distribution plants, it closed down our, our facilities, it closed down a lot of vaccination sites. Um, I was able to go out to the public and say, this is what this means. This is how many doses were behind. This is how long it's going to take us to catch up. And I was able to report every day because there were, there were, there were literally no excuses. And I think with a crisis like this, which is so difficult to manage, um, you know, and, and, and I've seen this from state governors, Republican and Democrat all over the country, not all of them made perfect decisions, In fact, nobody made all perfect decisions, but, but when they took accountability, were willing to stand out of the public and tell them the truth, not promise them, um, you know, fictional miracles or tell them the things about to end, uh, but just level with people, um, they, they gain respect uh, of, of everybody. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not a popularity contest. Maybe some of them won't be reelected because they had to make tough decisions. I sure as hell wouldn't love to be sitting here having to make a decision between bar and restaurant owners on the one hand and hospitals and people filling up hospitals on the other hand. It's extraordinarily difficult. And anybody who pretends that these are easy decisions hasn't had to make them. Um, but when, when, uh, But you have to make them. That's what you're elected for. And, and, and you're at a point where everybody in the country will help. Uh, and, and when he was in that spot in February and March, when the president was, I think he would have been a very smart move for him politically, as well as from a human, human standpoint to say, we got a problem, we need to pull together and I'll accept help. And that's the reason I called Jared is because I had some experience in running a government crisis. I had some experience in healthcare. I had some experience in government. I knew what he was going through. I know that it feels like the world's against you when you're in there. And I wanted to say, hey, there's no reason for this to be political. Let's pull together. That became increasingly challenging to do, but I didn't stop because at the end of the day, um, I, unlike you, I'm not a physician or a surgeon, so I can't actually save people's lives. Um, but what I do know is that, and, and I've learned this in part from you as well, Senator, is in the power of government, if you're in there doing things right, uh, fighting for people, you can't make a difference. And let's go a little bit deeper uh, in, 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 on that issue because it's really interesting. It's not kind of a sub theme in your book, uh, Preventable, um, but it's more about about you here in the sense that you seem to respond to government, whether it's Democrat or Republican, and sacrifice and participate. And and I think back to the the early Obamacare. Uh, Affordable Care Act when things were terrible. I mean, you know, right now the exchanges, things were crashing, computers, nobody could get on. And you kind of stuck up your hand. We'll come back to some earlier stories on that. And then you dedicated a period of your, of your life there um, in the midst of, of, of COVID. And you write about it in Preventable. Um, again, back in the private sector, but you raise your hand under Republican administration. You call Jared. Uh, you uh, dump, you dive in hugely, um, actively being critical, being objective, telling the story in route, and then you leave again, go back to the private sector, and then uh, President Biden and 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 uh, Ron Klain and others called a, a few months ago and say, well, the transition is is done. Uh, now we're in here, but we have hundreds of thousands of people still dying, and we've got to reverse this course. And once again, you raise your hand and you jump in. The, the, the thematic is apparent to me. It is this uh, you know, public servant, private sector, in and out, citizen, legislator, but not really legislator. What, what drives this raising the hand in a time of need? Well, on the one hand, I've... I've I, I don't know how this sounds, but I feel like I owe this country so much. Um, you know, I, I I live and take advantage of so much um, freedom and privilege and um, opportunity. And um, uh, so to some extent, it's not, it's not a stretch to say that it feels like it's a duty, but it also feels to me like it's sort of in some extent what everybody does. People do it at different scales, at different levels, different places. Um, in some ways, it's no different than um, bringing your neighbor um, something when they're sick or checking in on them. Um, it's just sort of what you do. Um, and it makes you feel good because you're contributing. Um, I, you know, the, the older I get, the clearer it is that you don't get your good feelings from just um, just um, kind of free will, fun-loving stuff, but from contributing. 
Um, but I will also tell you, you made me think when you asked this question, that each of these things has been slightly terrifying too. I mean, I'd be lying if I told you that, um, you know, that, that they're, that they're going to go in and, and they don't have just these crazy fearful moments. Um, going in to do this now with the, the Biden team when thousands of people were dying every day and were fearing variants and I wasn't clear what the path is, was a very heavy feeling. I, I don't mind telling you that I went in and I didn't sleep, not just because I was working around the clock. We were working quite hard, but then I'd get back to my apartment, which was a block from the White House, and there was just no way I could shut my eyes. Um, and I told myself that, that that was okay because the country expected us to lose sleep until we solve these problems. Um, so I'm not, just, I'm not saying this to say that there's a cost to me because as you know better than almost anybody I know, it, it is an extraordinary privilege and it feels like an extraordinary privilege at the time you, when you're, when you're in the white house or you're, in, in these kind of places. But if you do it, um, you got to really not forget why you're there. And, you know, fortunately I've been called in for missions where it's, it's very clear what the job is, whether it's fixing the computer systems behind Obamacare or whether it's, um, you know, getting the country vaccinated. Um, I become very single purpose and um, just basically, and you can do that in a crisis. It's because you don't have competing priorities. You basically, this is the priority. Slav it, go get it done. And then, then I can kind of focus. We don't need to, to go too much into the, the, the personal aspects of it, but I find it interesting um, to, to explore. Uh, and you do it in, in the book in, in sort of subtle, nuanced ways. In, in, uh, but effect on family, just example. I, 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 I loved my years in, in public service. And, and for years and years, I had to leave my family to go to do mission trips in Africa as part of medicine. Uh, but I want to explore with you just a little bit more because you dedicate the book to, to your wife, Lana, and, and uh, to your two kids, and you refer to them throughout. Uh, how much, is there a price that they pay with this running back and forth to, to Washington, D.C., and these middle-of-the-night tweets and the, the, the obsession that you have in responding to calls by your country, whether it's during – Republican administrations or Democratic administrations? You know, I don't know if you, what you found, and maybe this is a reflection on me, but, you know, when I had come home from Washington for four days and I was just so eager to see my kids, you know, and I've got two boys, I'd walk in the door and I'd get, you know, I'd get maybe a head nod and, a, you know, a hey, dad. Um, you know, because they were, they, you know, when they're teenagers and they're young adults, um, their parents are not the center of their universe, nor, nor should we be. And and Lana's just an extraordinary mom, um, the the best that they could ever hope for. So I missed them terribly, much more than than they missed me. And I felt like I missed out on um, some of my older son's high school that I'll never get back. Uh, there's just you know, there's just no you know no way no way of saying it differently. But um, but he you know I think as he gets older he knew what I was doing and he knew why I was doing it. And, um, and I think hopefully, hopefully he will have an, an ethic of contributing, um, and hopefully he'll look at it that way. Um, maybe he won't, maybe he will. Um, but you know, for me, selfishly, um, it was, an, those are extraordinary experiences too, that I feel like, um, I probably, but, but I, there's no question I traded off time with my boys during these periods of time that, that are quite valuable. But, you know, it's just interesting. And, and the reason I bring it up, uh, 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 because people do wonder how, how, uh, what motivates people to, to go in and out of government to contribute in sort of these selfless ways, uh, but also wonder of the impact on, on family. And in the book, you handle it, I think, beautifully, and you open with it. The dedication is there and, and the descriptions of going back and forth. And, and I think it's really quite beautiful in, in many ways. Going, going back to the book, you write that um, a response resembling what Germany and other developed countries uh, mustered would have saved 70 to 80 percent of the lives we lost. What do you mean uh, by that? What, what would the U.S. need to have done as a country 
to save 70 to 80 percent of the lives lost in the reference to, to Germany. Well, this is, of course, a very theoretical concept, right? If you look at the countries around the globe and you look at how well they did, um, and the book does this, but but not in a, not in a way that's like professorial, but in a way that I think is more uh, gettable and colloquial, hopefully, and preventable. Um, what you see are, are two patterns that emerge. One is that countries that have experience fighting pandemics or with public health crises before do better than countries that didn't. And very interesting, um, you've got places like Hong Kong and Japan and Thailand and so forth that are very close to China, a lot of cross-border travel, yet their death rates have been incredibly low. And in large part, uh, because they, they, in, in Africa would be another example. You know, 14% of the per capita deaths in, uh, in Africa of the U.S. And Africa is a poor country and we're a wealthy country. So you think, huh, wouldn't a wealthy country do better because we have better defenses and so forth? It turns out, it turns out no. The second factor is actually wealth equity, it turns out. If you look at the spread between the top 10% income earners and the bottom 10%, countries that have extremely wealthy and extremely poor do much worse than countries that are more balanced. So Brazil, Russia, the U.S., um, those are India, countries that have extreme wealth and extreme poverty um, and, 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 and a big distance between them. And some of this can be explained by the fact that, you know, we in the U.S. very simply designated about half or more of the population to be essential workers and said, you all need to grow the beef, grow the vegetables, deliver the, deliver the trucks, work in the warehouses, work in the grocery stores, um, and, and, all, and drive the trucks, and all those things are getting people exposed, deliver things to our house. And another set of people, um, myself included, um, the pandemic was not as much of a hardship. We were behind closed doors. There's all uncertainty and all kinds of things, but, but from, a, from a safety perspective, we were able to safely isolate, get deliveries, there's a, there's a chapter called the room service pandemic, which kind of draws these sort of stark, stark lines. And so the, you have the, that results in you have people in the black and brown communities and in older communities and in farm labor camps and border communities and in, in the Navajo Nation prisons dying in record numbers and people in suburban areas uh, and more well-to-do areas being basically, um, I wouldn't say untouched because that wouldn't be true, but, but, but touched to a lesser degree. And that feeling when a bunch of the population starts to feel relatively safe, when a, le- a lot of the population doesn't, um, is, is, is one of the things to talk about and to look at. But, but countries that have a more egalitarian structure and there's more of a common good um, in, in, the, in the society um, have much, much lower death rates. So you pick a country like Germany, Germany is kind of quite the middle country. It's got, it's got a lot of characteristics of the U.S. It's a complex country. It's increasingly diverse. Um, it has, um, you know, some experience in public health crises, but not a lot. And it has some experience, um, and it has, you know, it's slightly more egalitarian, but, but not, you know, certainly not to the extreme. And their per capita death rate was about 20% of the U.S.'s. So, again, it's all theoretical. Um, it's, it, 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 uh, or it's, it's in some part of the theoretical, but it, but it does say, why shouldn't we do better? You know, why shouldn't we have the same kind of death rate? Particularly, we're an island nation. We got good big borders. We got great defenses. We've got all kinds of resources. So why is it that five times more people died in the U.S. per capita than Germany? You're con- continuing the same thematic that, um, because the way, we, the way we began much of the book is about uh, the, the Trump, the administration, the response there. But in the book, book you also cover the issues we're just talking about. You also say we, we should uh, also consider that, and I'll quote, our nation's growing distrust of expertise, a media addicted to promoting controversy, and a people long out of the habit of shared sacrifice for the common good. Those are your words. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it, I think p- people listening to this generally understand that, that in, a, in a novel pandemic, experts aren't always going to be right. Um, but what was interesting here in the U.S. was the degree to which if um, 
um, people in a sort of, I think in a manipulative and somewhat bad faith fashion would, would, would find a scientist saying something that turned out to be incorrect and use that as a way to um, further their own opinion and say, see, that expert was wrong. Therefore, you can't trust these experts. And we became, we, we became for, for whatever reason or for a variety of reasons, very suspicious that the people that were telling us things didn't know what they were talking about. And that was a common refrain. And the problem with that, Bill, is this is if this were a hurricane and you could look out your window and you can see, you know, trees swaying and you can see the dark sky, you'd know what was going on and you wouldn't need an expert. You got your own eyes. The problem with a pandemic like this one is there's a few things that are going on that you'll never see with your naked eye. One is asymptomatic spread. So the fact that you could be passing this disease on to other people without knowing it, um, that's something that scientists would have to tell you and you'd have to believe or, or, or not believe. You know, second, exponential growth. The fact that, that what what is 50 deaths in one day, several months later, it can be 100,000 deaths. Uh, that defies kind of our logical thinking of how our brain works. But it happened. Um, but you'd have to believe a scientist to believe that was going to happen. That when there were 50 deaths, scientists could look at that 50 and say, that 50 turned into 100,000 pretty fast. So if you don't trust science, and you don't trust scientists, you don't trust expertise. Um, and by the way, trusting them doesn't mean believing that they're infallible. Trusting them believes that they're studying the data and they'll give you the best information they have at the time. So one question for our for our is why have we become so stilted against experts that way? Um, another you raise is you know there 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 is a, uh, there were other structural things you know the inequality in our society we've talked about that a little bit um, but but I think th- those things came home to roost uh, and to hurt us certainly as you see in the numbers of where people were dying where people weren't dying and so this the the, the book preventable focuses on some some of the lives of certain people. You know, a guy uh, who worked in an Amazon warehouse and, and what happened with him. And you, and you could see up close, it's not preachy, but you could see up close. He couldn't get, he couldn't get a COVID test. He was sick. He couldn't get a COVID test because they weren't enough. He couldn't show Amazon a COVID test. So Amazon stopped paying him. He lived in a two bedroom apartment with his five kids, wife with breast cancer. One of his kids with cerebral palsy. Um, he had no income uh, and he had to recover at home in one bedroom while his wife and his five kids slept in the other bedroom. Um, and this was a very common occurrence, lived in public housing uh, in, in Minnesota. Um, and, but out of the eye, out of the naked eye for, for, of many of us, the kind of stories that happened all over the place that, that, that weren't being told. And so the book asks the question, you know, are there things we could be doing differently? Are there things we should have a dialogue about? It doesn't preach answers um, as much as it says, what do we learn about ourselves? I'll give you another example. We learned, uh, many of us, during the pandemic, that there's a lot of kids that weren't eating lunch except if they could go to school. And then when they went home, they didn't have internet access. Now, that was true before the pandemic. It was true during the pandemic. And, you know, it's up to us whether it'll be true after the pandemic. Um, Do we take those things that we learned and do we say, hey, um, now is a good time to fix them because, because we know they're real problems. And um, so to some extent, um, how we react to this pandemic um, is as important as how we reacted during the pandemic. Are there things, and, and I want to come back to that because at the end of the book, um, it, it's not a, it's, you know, it's sort of you, you bring the book up to date, the book's just out, but President Biden clearly is moving much more into uh, infrastructure, anti-poverty moves, recent legislation, recent bills, recent acts, which do more holistically address uh, some of the issues around inequity, inequality, um, 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 implicit bias um, that that are being addressed today. Um, it it and we don't we don't know how uh, how effective they will be, but it does look like our government in the whole, forget Democrat Republican administration, is responding, addressing many of the issues in a more aggressive fashion than in the past in the past around these equity issues. Most conversations are beginning with discussions around equity, not because of the pandemic, but because they pre-existed, as you point out, but were exacerbated with that with that light uh, 
on it. But the, we, let's, if we have time, we'll come back to that. Is uh, what about the things that that, that did go well? Uh, or were there things in there that that were done that that are are rock? Right. That the Trump team actually yep. stood up and did. You mentioned uh, uh, you know briefly about the the China and. Uh, transportation and closing down borders there, but were there things in a bigger picture in terms of operation warp speed or that the Trump team Mm -hmm. right during the pandemic? Yeah. 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 So there's an extraordinary story in the book that is actually the real story of warp speed, um, which is fascinating. And it's really driven by three career civil servants, um, Peter Marks and the FDA, um, Barney Graham, who, who worked for Tony Fauci at, at the NIH, um, and Rick Bright from, uh, from BARDA, which is, in, which is a government agency that invests in bio defenses. So first of all, you and me as taxpayers for the last two decades have been funding basic research into this, MR, what we now know, all know as this mRNA platform. And, and Tony Fauci at NIH has been funding it and it's been a, it's been going on through Republican and Democratic administrations going back to the George W. Bush presidency. And it's been going on in the public and the private sector with this company Moderna. Um, mode RNA, if, if people look at their name, the last three letters, messenger RNA. Um, and it was one of those things we've been investing in and never used. Um, but what happened was uh, this platform was 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 there because of of the of SARS and MERS and those threats, and when the pandemic hit, um, on the first day we downloaded the sequence, the genomic sequence on January 11th. Uh, Tony Fauci and his team downloaded it, and on the 13th they sent that over to Moderna, and the vaccine work began. Um, and what Operation Warp Speed was now, Peter uh, Peter Marks, who's at the FDA, is an extraordinary guy, an unsung hero. Star Wars fan. Apparently that's why he called it Operation Warp Speed. And his story is told throughout Preventable. Um, he, he decided that rather than a typical FDA process where a company goes and does some studies, gets some data, sends it into the FDA and the FDA evaluates it. He said, why don't we send FDA people and um, BARDA people and NIH people directly to the major pharma companies that are, that are working on these vaccines and they can observe things with them real time. So we don't have to go back and forth. We can save, we can, we don't have to cut corners. We can just save all the administrative time and paperwork of the bouncing back and forth. And he put this proposal together and they brought it to Alex Azar, who is, this, uh, who is uh, Trump's health secretary. And Azar liked it. And they went, and, and of course, Congress uh, funded it. So this is truly a situation where it's a feel good story Everybody has had a hand in the success. Career civil servants, the political leaders who, who funded it, the people all the way from George W. Bush era all the way up through the Trump era, including Obama, who, who continued to fund it and support it, the private sector, the public sector. And we ought not be chintzy with credit. Um, we ought not say, well, this person contributed 18% and that person contributed 13% or that person didn't do very much. When things go well in this country, we ought to be generous about it. And, you know, I was on Fox News when I was in the Biden White House and was asked the question, do you contribute any success of having the vaccines to the Trump administration? And I said, absolutely. I tip my hat to the, to the Trump team. And um, it became a political alert and I said, okay, I'm going to hear about this inside the White House for sure. Uh, but no one said a word um, to me about it. Um, so, so, the, so the truth is, <laughs> I don't know if you relate to this this way, having gone to medical school, but we, I think we, I think we near, damn near aced the hard sciences, and we, and we probably close to failed all the soft sciences, sociology, psychology, humanities. I think we did do very well, but when it came to um, the hard sciences, um, we have so much to be proud of. And the, 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 one of the things that, that um, you do in the book, Preventable um, uh, Stress, and just by writing the book, it, it represents, and that is the emphasis on communication and uh, how important that is uh, all of the time, especially in times of crisis when people 
um, have a tendency to panic when the world is chaotic, when messages um, may be confused because of social media and the, the wrong news that is that is shared is just factually incorrect and is unscientific. Um, but again, 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 you come back to communication. Um, it takes years, it takes months and years to, to build public trust. And once you lose it, it can be, it, it's gone and it's hard to regain. And it was something that I emphasized a, a lot back in, in 2005. Um, I had a pandemic preparedness plan. I was still in the United States Senate. I put it forward. It failed to get any congressional action at all. Uh, we even talked about 500,000 deaths at that time, how unimaginable it will be, how inevitable it was. But in the recommendations that that I made, that we made uh, at that time, this is 2005, 15, 16 years ago, um, and we knew a pandemic was going to come, um, uh, is unfiltered information. What? How do we handle that? Um, COVID-19. Share with, share with us what you've learned uh, about communication. You committed early on to be out there regularly, um, every night tweeting or tweeting during the day to share information in real time, what the reality is, unfiltered, getting it out. So share with us what you have in the book, um, in, uh, Preventable, about communication, but also the why. Uh, why have you been so active? Why is it so important for the American people to hear in real time what is going on? So when when I got asked to lead the, the briefings uh, with Fauci and um, Rochelle Walensky from the CDC at the beginning of the Biden term, um, the thing I was so focused on is exactly what you're talking about, which is, you know, only 40% of people said they were going to take the vaccine at the time. Um, People were impatient, untrusting. They couldn't get a vaccine appointment, um, angry. And, and, and I was out to be the public face. And it's actually one thing I said that was felt so minor at the time that I learned was so important. I was asked a question by a reporter about people being frustrated, et cetera. And I said, look, we have a shortage of vaccines. Let me just be very plain. We have a shortage of vaccines. That shortage is going to exist for weeks, maybe a couple months at the outside. When that shortage is done, there will be an abundance of vaccines. But in the meantime, it's going to be frustrating. Um, It's going to be aggravating because we in the U.S. are used to having what we want when we want it. And for the next few weeks or months, that's not going to be the case. So I thought that was a direct answer to a a good question. Um, The response I got was overwhelming. Um, Nurses, doctors, um, ordinary citizens saying basically, I felt for the first time in a long time like I was treated with respect, treated like an adult, given the facts that could help me set my expectations um, and while I don't feel like what you said was optimistic, all of a sudden I feel more hopeful because I feel like um, I feel like you'll tell us the truth. And Bill, I can tell you that was just um, there was nothing extraordinary about what I said. As you, as you know, it was just um, very plain. But I think um, the lesson for me was so powerful from that conversation that. Uh, people just want the truth, they good or bad. They want they want to feel hopeful if you're hopeful, but they want to also know when you're concerned, and they want to know what they should be concerned about, and um, they want to know that they can. And that's I think how we we built back some trust. Um, and obviously, it's a very divided country, and you can't build trust with everybody, um, but you can do the best you can. And you know, it's dangerous. I mean. You know far more about Washington than I do, but it's it often feels risky and dangerous for people to show vulnerability or say something that's not quite demonstrating that you're that you've got it nailed. And it's very tempting at all times to when someone asks a question to reassure them. Um, but um, but I never ran for office. Um, I was there to do a job and tell the public the truth. And um, so maybe it, you know I wasn't a subject to what people who are elected politicians have to deal with. But you think you, you, in your paper in, in, in 2005, 
that I think is an important lesson, and I think Alex Azar knows this, is you don't play pandemic response by intuition, and you don't have to. There, there, are, there is kind of a rule book on the right way to do things, including what you say, because during a pandemic, until you have a vaccine, public communication is your medicine, right? How we as a public respond is going to have the most direct impact on how many people live or die. So so it's not a matter of PR. Um, There's a science, as you know, and as you laid out, but around what you say to the public and how. And um, because you can confuse people very, very easily, even with the best of intentions. And so, you know, no doubt mistakes have been made all throughout, or no doubt I made my own mistakes, I'm sure of it. Um, uh, but if you, if you stick to the playbook and, and, and this sort of improvisational nature of Trump, um, worked against him in my view. Is there, uh, you, you open or early in the book, you, you talk about, uh, the story with Jeff and I, I bring it up only because as people listen to you and me, they say, you know, what drives people out of their normal lives to go to this period of public service, spending a time, 12 years, like I did the Senate or, or your times coming in and out and making contributions. And just in, in a couple of minutes, uh, share the story of, of Jeff and how it initially motivated you to change the course of your life. And it's in the book, Preventable. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Yes. Um, so uh, when I was 31, um, uh, one of my closest friends, uh, who, who was a doctor, actually, um, go in his post-residency, um, also 31, married, twin, one-year-old, started experiencing numbness in his arm, which, ter- which turned out to be a brain tumor and turned out to be very advanced. And, you know, between January and July, he passed away, July 2nd. Um, and his, his widow and their twins came to live with my wife and I. And in fact, these kids now are uh, 20 some years old. We just put them through college. They're both out of college. Um, that's how long ago this was. Um, but out of, out of the backs of that, um, uh, but that's really what threw me in the healthcare system when I saw what happened to Jeff and when I saw what happened to Lynn afterwards and um, the people trying to push her into bankruptcy because of the five months of medical costs, I decided to start a business that was focusing on helping the un and underinsured. This was the late nineties, well before Obamacare um, when things were even, even, even harder for people. Um, so I think a lot of people are in healthcare motivated by personal stories of some sort. I find um, and I also find that you have to find ways to keep it real if you're in the healthcare system, um, and, and, and be connected to those kinds of stories. Andy, your, your leadership style, you and I've worked with the Bipartisan Policy Center. We've worked with, um, uh, a foundation that you founded that, that looks at, at, at the appropriate transformations going on at the state level. And in so many ways. Uh, your leadership style, uh, it's, it's nuanced through the book Preventable, uh, and, and you referred to it. But, but um, in, in the book, you said that when you ran CMS, uh, Medicare and, and Medicaid, you always started your day by reading and even responding to individual emails from, from uh, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. They'd write you an email and you'd respond. Um, people wouldn't think that you don't have time. You're dealing with these big issues, trying to you know do your best and altering the course of history. But you you describe that as being very important to you. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you know, you can imagine the situation you must have to be in to send an email to send an email to the administrator of CMS. So nobody even knows who the heck that is. But if you're a Medicare beneficiary. And, and you're sending the CMS administrator a letter. And oftentimes it's a, it's a you know, it's a letter. It could say, any, I mean, I got some, uh, Bill, I got one that once said, um, Andy, um, my, I'm in my kitchen and my wheelchair battery has run out and I can't move. Um, and they and I get, get sent it to me. And, uh, and I got some that were extraordinarily sad and challenging. People who had developmentally disabled children who they thought were um, a subject of abuse and I just decided, you know, I'm going to spend my day getting yelled at by the White House or senators or lobbyists or whoever. Um, I'm going to, I want to ground myself and the agency 
in the work we're doing. Taxpayers give CMS a lot of money to, to provide benefits, to, benefits for people. People save their whole lives to get Medicare. Um, so, um, you know, I, I came from the private sector. Uh, I didn't want to private sectorize the government, but I did want to bring the, the sort of touch and feeling of our commitment to beneficiaries, which I knew was inside the agency. And so I would read these emails and then um, I would re- I would reply, even if my reply was, I read this, I hear you, someone will get back to you. It, it may, I hope it's as quick as you need it to be, but I, but I will stay on it. And um, people would just be, their responses were hilarious because, you know, you write to this government bureaucrat, you've probably fired off 50 letters and you can't get a response and you're feeling helpless. You feel like the government's not responsive. And, and so people would just like jaw drop. I can't even believe you responded to me. And then we had a, I had a liaison who would follow up and try to solve a problem. It was really you know, fun. It, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's good for people to hear. And it's also good for, for policymakers and people who are in, in Washington and state governments to hear the immediacy of, of being able to talk to real people it gets hard. It's hard to do when you're in Washington, D.C. You're surrounded by people. Everything seems so big. But it's good to hear that there are people like you and other policymakers who do search for that intimacy to bring bring things back to, to, to home and to color what policy that, that we're doing. The Just a, a couple more things. I know we need to wrap things up. But um, in, in the book, you, you talk about COVID-19, that we should review uh, it as a starter bug, that when another pandemic uh, comes, that as it will, as we, we know it will, it's biology, and it's been around for millions of years, a lot longer than human beings have. Um, do you believe we'll respond differently? And if you're leading, if you, for example, were leading the response at that time, what, what would you do differently? Well, so look, there's some technical things that we've got to do better at, um, and I'm and I'm fairly confident we will. We'll invest in um, va- vaccine manufacturing capability. I think we can cut even this very fast time of development even further. Uh, we will presumably have the strategic stockpile of ventilators and and, and masks and everything we ran out of um, well in hand, and, and I think we could turn that into a nice manufacturing capacity in the country. Um, uh, we need to we need to um, up our game on the, uh, uh, on the CDC. CDC is an invaluable resource. We need to reform it, not complain about it. But reforming it means we need rapid response capabilities, and we need the ability to um, spot things quickly on other sides of the globe. And but occasionally, that even the best CDC is not going to get it done. Sometimes the bug's going to be too powerful, too overwhelming. And when that happens, um, you know, th- there's two features to a bug that we worry about. One is how contagious is it? And the second is how lethal is it? There's other things, but those are those are sort of two of the important ones. And on the scale of things, you know, I think COVID-19 is moderately contagious, not extremely. I mean, the measles is seven or eight times more contagious. And, it, and there are bugs that are far more lethal, like Ebola um, and others. So you could end up in a situation where the reason I call it a starter bug is that it ought to be the way we look at it. We ought to say there's a different kind of bug that comes in. What if next time it hits kids instead of older people? What if next time it's more contagious or more deadly? The, the, the habits and patterns and the things that we did this time around and, and, and all the fights we had over individual liberties versus the collective good versus, you know, a mask mandate versus, you know, stay at home orders, you know, all the things people, uh, protested against what's going to happen next time. And, and, and I think the answer is we don't know. Um, but it's, that's the harder part. It's still the soft science stuff, Bill. I think it's, it's, are we going to have a real dialogue in the country led by community leaders, locally church, churches, um, uh, civil, civil leaders, others. Can, can we have a real dialogue about some of those things so that we think about them, because I think that's the only way that um, we get better and get better as a country. I think one thing you and I both know is when the country puts its mind to it, we can do anything. We can do anything. Uh, I have eminent confidence 
that we can defeat it. Um, but we have to be uh, sometimes willing to look at the hard lessons. And in, uh, in, in 30 seconds, optimistic or, or pessimistic, you work with multiple administrations, um, your, your value system is, is very clear in terms of uh, and gets reflected in, in uh, the policies you propose and articulating the, the principles behind you, but optimistic or, or pessimistic? Well, I'm always optimistic. Um, I think this op- my optimism is a little precarious. Uh, because I think so many things in the country are, um, you know, way, way we're in our balance. But, um, you know, the, the reason we should all be optimistic is because we're willing to do the work. You know, if, if we sat back and there weren't extraordinary people like Senator Frist and others in this country that had, had the capability and the knowledge and, and many others to do the work, um, there'd be no reason to be optimistic. But I'm optimistic because of all of us and the power of what we can do. And I think as the book closes, it says, you know, a couple of things. One is we have to include everybody. Grief and and suffering don't need to be ranked. If you've lost a job, if you lost a business, if you've lost a family member, your grief ought to be treated the same. Secondly, being in the majority is no excuse for not including the minority in the conversation because uh, that's just not a right of the majority. It shouldn't be a right of the majority. And the third is, even if you try to include everybody guess what there's still bad people out there and sometimes we're going to run into those bad people at just the wrong moment and we need to defeat them we good needs to defeat evil so all of those things are can i think can be true at the same time andy slavitt it's all about the conversation and uh, the book uh, preventable the inside story of how leadership failures politics and selfishness doom the u.s coronavirus response a, a huge contribution, Andy, that you have given uh, all of us and and uh, lessons about this country, lessons about our values and what we can do better in the future. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Senator. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. Be sure to check out our Q&A podcast for intriguing hour-long conversations with people who are making things happen. On this Sunday's episode, Edward Slingerland on his book, Drunk, a look at the role drinking has played throughout history. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts.